Piloting a high-performance military jet aircraft is the goal of many young men and women, but it is a difficult dream to attain. In 1986, a talented young Marine made an impulsive choice after receiving some bad news. That time that a Marine ground crewman stole an $18 million Marine Corps jet fighter deserves to be remembered. A May 18, 1984 article in the Los Angeles Times describes what might be called a young man whose interest in flight was typical. Howard Buddy Foote developed an interest in aviation after building model airplanes at age 12 and became determined to be a pilot after taking his first ride at a commercial airliner at age 14. The young man, however, then just 18, took that interest higher and farther than most. He earned his pilot's license at age 16, joined a soaring club in Long Beach, and proceeded to break the California Junior Altitude record in an unpowered glider, flying at 33,140 feet. High altitude soaring is not a simple skill. Story explained that the best conditions for high altitude soaring require passing through severe ground level weather. The altitudes at which the teenager was flying were deadly cold, around minus 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and required oxygen equipment or the pilot would pass out within minutes. But he wasn't doing this on his own. His efforts were supported by a group of British and American aeronautical engineers who were supporting his attempt to break the world's record for high altitude flying in an unpowered glider. Among his supporters was Marine Brigadier General Art Bloomer, who was commanding officer of the nearby Marine Air Station El Toro near Irvine, California. Already an accomplished pilot and well-known within the gliding community, after graduating high school, Foote chose to enlist in the Marine Corps in 1986. He became an A4 aviation mechanic at El Toro. His goal was to obtain a commission through the Corps Enlisted Commissioning Program, a program where an enlisted Marine earns a four-year degree and then can be commissioned as an officer, a requirement to become a pilot. A friend from high school noted that Foote had talked about his glider flying in a class presentation and said that his goal was to fly the Douglas A4M Skyhawk. The Skyhawk is a delta-winged, single turbojet engine, subsonic, carrier-capable attack aircraft. Entering service in 1956, the A-4 served with the United States in the Vietnam War, with the Israeli Air Force in the Yom Kippur War, and with the Argentine Air Force in the Falklands War. Designed to be lightweight, the A-4 served with both the Navy and Marines, but also with a number of foreign navies, where its small size allowed it to be operated off of smaller aircraft carriers. The plane was also used by the Navy Flight Demonstration Team, the Blue Angels. The Agile Fighter was used by the Navy as the primary adversary aircraft at the Navy Fighter Weapons School, known as Top Gun. The plane served as a training surrogate for the MiG-17, and its superb low-speed handling made it an excellent aircraft for training aviators in air combat maneuvering. While the Navy continued to use the A-4 in flight training, the Marines had passed on the Navy's frontline replacement, the LTV A-7 Corsair II. And yes, Corsair means pirate. Thus, at the time he entered the service, the Marines were still operating the A-4 in their attack squadrons with the primary mission of air support for ground units. According to his high school buddy, Foote could have flown with any branch, but chose the Marines because he wanted to fly the A-4. But in February 1986, Foote's dreams were ruined. Foote had continued flying high-altitude gliders in his off-duty time, still seeking to break the world altitude record. While flying at 42,500 feet, Foote suffered an aerial embolism, a blockage in the bloodstream caused by lack of oxygen. It's an affliction similar to the bends suffered by divers. It's caused when the human body fails to adapt to a quick change in pressure. Foote was able to recover and land the glider, but was then informed by a flight surgeon that suffering the embolism meant that Foote would be unable to fly for the Marines. Foote and his family disagreed with General Bloomer over the event. Foote's father Bud contended in a 1988 interview in the Los Angeles Times that it was the general who got Buddy's head all turned around and that Foote had flown too high at the general's urging. He said that if the general had left Buddy alone, everything would have turned out fine. Reportedly, General Bloomer had tried to get the altitude record flight to be a Marine Corps sanctioned event, but he was not able to get approval. Had he succeeded, the Corps would likely have provided a pressure suit, which would have made the attempt much safer. Bloomer insisted that he tried to discourage Foote from going about 30,000 feet without the pressure suit. Foote said that he felt that the general had given him a job to do. My job was to break glider records. Foote was upset that none of the people in command who had encouraged him in his high-altitude glider record attempts would come forward and get me a medical waiver so I could fly jets. 
The 20-year-old Marine reportedly became extremely depressed over what he saw as the loss of his dream. He'd signed up for the Marines to become a pilot, not a line officer. In the early morning hours of July 4th, he made an interesting decision. He decided that he was going to steal an $18 million Marine jet fighter. In the early morning hours, Foote donned a flight suit and drove a yellow truck of the type used to deliver pilots up to an A-4M of Marine Attack Squadron VMA-214, the Black Sheep. A sentry noticed him, but assumed that a mechanic was performing nighttime maintenance work on the aircraft, something a Marine spokesman later described as not uncommon. But maintenance was not the young man's plan. He told the LA Times, I had worked my entire life for this flight. There was nothing else. He fired at the plane, which was unarmed, and closed the canopy, taxied over a nearby runway, which was unlit, pushed the throttle forward, and took off. Lance Corporal Brenda Miller, the sentry in charge of the area, was heading for an authorized break when she heard the plane's engine as it taxied for the runway. That's what clued me that there was something wrong, she would later say in a hearing. No plane should have been on the runway, which was closed. Retired Marine Corps Major Richard Harden recalled that night, saying it was about midnight when he heard an A-4 depart the field. He said, I was wondering who had the wavos to do a closed field departure. Must have been somebody really important, I surmised, from my base housing quarters. Lance Corporal Miller chased the plane down the runway, but was unable to get the pilot's attention. She had a sidearm, but chose not to draw it, saying she did not have an accurate shot. It seems extraordinary that Foote could manage to take off in an unfamiliar, high-tech fighter aircraft from a darkened runway, despite his experience piloting gliders. But as a mechanic, he was familiar with the plane. Moreover, he had spent significant time training on an A-4 simulator, something Harden speculated he'd been able to wrangle because he was a celebrity of sorts among the local gliding community. The rumor, Harden noted, was that Foote had had more time on the simulator than active duty aviators. The runway was closed and there were no air traffic controllers on duty, so Foote's flight was not tracked. But news reports at the time said that he spent about 45 minutes over the ocean executing high-speed maneuvers. An aviation maintenance officer later testified that one of the gauges indicated that the plane had undergone considerable gravitational pressure. A Marine spokesman later simply said, he had some fun up there. He was not being tracked, and the Marines decided not to send a plane up to chase him, but he still chose to return to El Toro. He flew over the field five times, which one of the sentries interpreted as a request to turn on the runway light so he could safely land. The lights were turned on, and he landed the plane. He was immediately arrested by armed military police. The aviation maintenance officer had just arrived and asked him if he had had a good flight. He responded that he thought we had a generator problem with the engine. Foote was not found to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and upon inspection, the aircraft was found to be undamaged. El Toro had no prison facility, so Foote was confined at the brig at Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton near San Diego. The charges were serious. He was charged with misappropriating the truck and the plane, damaging the aircraft, disobeying regulations, flying without proper training or approval, and recklessly disregarding the plane's mechanical condition. At the time of his theft, the plane's aileron rigging was out of alignment, and the nose steering mechanism was not working properly, rendering the plane, from a mechanical standpoint, not a flyable airplane. But the most significant charge was hazarding a vessel. While the other charges might render lengthy prison sentences, the hazarding a vessel charge, intended to prevent the safety risk of mishandling naval ships, could result in the death penalty. Foote was held in the brig at Camp Pendleton for four and a half months, where Major Harden said his daring stunt made him somewhat of a cult hero among both officers and enlisted alike. His military attorney sought to have the hazarding charge, which had never been, for, been applied to the misappropriation of an airplane, thrown out. Several officers, including General Bloomer, spoke on his behalf. Bloomer later said, Buddy was a sterling Marine with an unblemished record who had done a lot of things that people a lot older could only dream about doing. I only regret that he screwed up. A good career. After 122 days in the brig, a time in which the commanding officer testified he maintained a good and positive attitude, all charges were dropped. Foote was required to write a letter of apology, was given a less than honorable discharge. He said that he would like to have paid the Marines back for the problems that he created, but understood that it would be difficult for the Corps to take him back. Brigadier General D.E.P. Miller, who had replaced Bloomer in command at Del Toro, said that his lack of judgment and violation of trust make it impossible to keep him in the Marine Corps. In a written statement, Miller said, this was a very unusual case in which a Marine with a tremendous amount of skill and great potential did a very stupid thing which could have resulted in a tragic loss of life. The military had likely taken into account not only that several officers had spoken on his behalf, but his mental state due to being told that he would no longer qualify for flight school, 
and also his otherwise spotless record and good behavior while in custody. His military attorney told the LA Times that Foote's unauthorized flight should be treated for what it was, a once-in-a-lifetime flight from reality, not the beginning, of criminal conduct. Surprisingly, Buddy Foote was not the only ground crewman who would steal an aircraft in history. Notably, in 2018, a Horizon Air ground service agent stole one of the airline's Bombardier Q400 aircraft from Seattle's SeaTac Airport. He flew through several aeronautical maneuvers for which the plane was clearly not designed before crashing the plane. In May of 1969, a 23-year-old Air Force crew chief who had been passed over for a promotion stole a C-130 cargo plane from a base in England, crashing it into the English Channel. Luckily, Buddy Foote's joyride ended up better than those two examples did. After his discharge from the Marines, he attended Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida and eventually qualified to fly more than 20 types of aircraft, including obtaining a special waiver that allowed him to fly a Russian-made jet fighter aircraft as a hobby. He was still intent on flying the A-4 and attempted to enlist in both the Israeli Air Force and the Honduran Air Force so that he could fly the plane, but neither one of those worked out. In 1991, he was back in the LA Times, this time as a test pilot for a new experimental aircraft that was powered with microwaves. And in 1992, he was in the news again, this time trying to break more aeronautical records in another experimental aircraft. By 2001, the Palm Springs Desert Sun reported that he had shifted his energies to developing technology for something called space power, which is a technology that would have satellites around the Earth collecting solar power from the sun and beaming it back to the Earth using either lasers or microwaves. And in, as of 2009, he still had a company that was building that technology. He had also started racing a car at a local racetrack in California where he had earned the nickname Lead Foot. He has at least two patents for experimental aircraft and engines and worked with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and all around seems to have overcome the bad decision that he made when he was a young man at the age of 20. In 1986, he told the LA Times, I just wanted to fly it one time. I didn't sign up to become a line officer. I joined up to fly. But I think I'm going to become a lot more productive now that I've left the service.